Good morning, Brian. Good morning, Dan. Good, Good morning. morning. And, and Dan, uh, welcome to Are You Happy Without the Movie? Haley's and my uh, very simple organic podcast that um, Haley and I met uh, a year or so ago. A friend said, you guys should know each other. And we, we started talking and, and on Zoom and and I said, Haley, we should record this. It's good, good stuff. And so we started and we've had some really interesting guests and in interesting conversations between the two of us. But um, first, thank you for joining us. Uh, Dan Bolin, Dan Bolin wrote to me, that's how we know each other, and, and told me that after reading my uh, new book uh, on being gay and gray and my earlier book on being gay, that he identified with a lot of what I wrote. And that at age 70, after two marriages, he came, he came out. And, uh, and, and Haley and I would consider that the hero's journey, which is what we talk about. And so we just wanted to you know, talk to you about the process. And I'm gonna let Haley start off. Haley, you got a question. I have so many questions. <laughs> I think, and I'm gonna try and sort of order it sort of from the beginning. Um, and try and create a bit of a path here because I feel like this is one of the conversations where we could be off in tangents and confuse everybody. Um, so I think Dan, just from the earliest sort of, what was your childhood? What was your life like? And sort of how did you get to this point of, you know, coming out of the closet, so to say? A very good question, Haley. Um... I was raised in a, a, a very uh, abusive environment. I was second of seven children. Uh, my parents had three boys in a row and then they had four girls in a row. Hmm. And I was second oldest, but I was the one that um, my dad had a hard time with. I think it was because I was more emotional. I was different than my two brothers. My, uh, my older brother uh, is actually, I would say, uh, very introverted and withdraws from from the family, so I became the what we became called the the one that everybody would come to in the family to get help. My my dad was very successful in the grocery store business. Um, he was raised by a very abusive father, uh, and I believe uh, and I've come to to peace with my father before he died, which is of course recorded in my book. But I think I I began to realize at an early age that my father was uh, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, and he also used distance to be able to separate himself from the family. I knew when I was a child at seven years old that I liked boys. Um, and I remember wrestling with boys my age in the neighborhood and beginning to feel like, gosh, I'm different than, than these boys. Uh, or different and when I was wrestling with these boys and I find them to be attractive. Now, I didn't know anything about sex at the time. I didn't know what it was, but I knew I was different mm -hmm. and that different was not good for me. So I began to feel like I was flawed, severely flawed at a very young age. And uh, so when my father would take on his abuse of my mother physically and emotionally, I would be the one that would stand up with him. Mm -hmm. the, and get in front of my mother and said, you're not going to treat my mother like that. Now they call me Danny. Danny is my real name. And because of that, my dad then would transfer a lot of his abuse to me. Um, so I really never had a relationship with my father at that time. It got so bad to the point that I actually hated my dad, not disliked him. We're talking mm -hmm. hatred. And I had to do a lot of work around that over the years to be able to come to peace with my dad before he died. But I knew he was different. Now, I was raised back in the generation, and Brian can relate to this, in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, there's no way you're gonna come out as gay. Um, it was a generation that was considered to be perverted. It was considered to be disgusting. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association, at that time, called it a mental illness. And so for me to come out and express who I knew I was would have been great damage to me. In fact, I believe that my father would have killed me, would have physically probably killed me if I came out at that time. So the way I dealt with it is, is trying to become an overachiever. I became um, 
valedictorian of the school. I became senior Paul King. Um, I was everything I could to get my dad's approval. In addition to that, I worked uh, pretty much full time at his grocery store in Alaska called B&B Markets, which does not stand, his name is Benny or Ben Bolin, um, but it stands for Better Buys. And so I would have to work after I finished schooling, I'd have to get over to work and I'd work for from 3.30 till eight o'clock at night. And then Saturday and Sunday would be working 12 hours a day. So I, um, and I hated, I hated the grocery business. I did not like it. But even today, when I go into a grocery store, I smell that smell. It's like, <laughs> okay, you get what you need and get out of here. Uh, so I began to um, be very successful in school, became a president of the student body, uh, high achiever, received two awards to go on to college from Montgomery Ward and Sears and Roebuck at the time, uh, all paid education for four years, room and board at the University of Alaska, where I went and attended that. But at, during this time, my mother uh, got contacted with Jehovah's Witnesses. She had previously been a Mormon, contacted her and started studying with, and there's a whole series in the book about this, but she ended up becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses. When that happened, the rage of my dad increased even more. Was your, dad, was your dad a Mormon? If, no, if, my dad was non-religious at all. He was non-religious. Non-religious. Yeah, if I could just interrupt for one minute, sure, Dan. No problem. Uh, if, if you're describing for me a classic growing up experience of a gay kid who's the one in the family that everyone goes to because they sense something in him that says, I'm open, right? And yeah. and the super achiever was hoping that, you know, if he's the best little boy in the world, then him his being gay is not going to be uh, taken. It'll be taken in consideration with the big picture, you know. And, and, I, and I think it was yeah. a way of getting my dad to love me. Yeah, which yeah. I'm sure he did in his own way. But I think I think he did. I think he did. Uh, and there's a whole story of how we came together. And and before he died, I. I came to great peace with him. But uh, so during that time, I'm sorry, Brian, did I answer your question or were you able to give your comment? No, 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 you you, you did. I, but I wanna say before, because we haven't told people yet, you have a book called The Courage to Be Courageous, that which is gonna be coming out um, in the fall. September, October, uh-huh. Good, all right. It's, it's actually been completed. Uh, we're doing the editing. Uh, Landon Napoleon, who is an incredible writer, uh, has been writing that with me uh, and it's coming out in September, October. It's completely done, but we've been spending hours at my home here in Arizona because uh, he lives in Arizona also and uh, doing the editing, which is very, very tearful, very mm -hmm. uh, cathartic, very passionate. Um, and I'll tell you the whole history. I had not planned on coming out with a book. Um, when I came out as gay and went through my series of events that brought me to where I'm at today, I, I, I wanted to do it for my own cathartic reason, not necessarily because um, I wanted my, my family to read it. Because, jumping ahead a little bit, because I got kicked out of the church, my family can have nothing to do with me. I haven't had any of my brothers and sisters have any response, they won't respond to me. And so part of me um, wants them to understand the real Danny as a gay man, yep. not Danny as a pretender. Right. Uh, and is, so, your, Dan, is your whole family Jehovah Witness? Yes. Okay. And yeah. I, I did some research on it this morning because I'm unfamiliar with uh, the tenets. And Haley, I don't know if you are, but <clears throat> Jehovah Witnesses, um, if somebody is shunned, uh, nobody can have contact with that person. And yeah, you know, in the family, outside the family, the person is ostracized. So, but back up a little bit, you, uh, your mom becomes a Jehovah Witness and you all become Jehovah Witness, right? Yeah, but there was a process in that because I didn't become a Jehovah's Witness because when my mother became Jehovah's Witness, which got more of the ire of my dad and more rage, and more hatred toward her. She would try to study the Bible with us. And we'd have to, when she, he would come home, we'd have to hide the books because oh. we know that he would, um, he would go, he would go ballistic. 
And so I learned to um, hate that teaching of Jehovah's Witness, not, not so mm-hmm. much Jehovah's Witnesses, but just the fact is it was taking me, I saw it, it, it caused more damage in my family when my mother would study with us and respond. So I totally became agnostic at the time. Mm. Um, I believe there may Are, be a... Degree, Dan, how I, old I, were you at that point? I would have been probably... Um, well, she started studying with us. She, she got connected with him in 1947, the year I was born. Uh, but to where she uh, did a secret baptism and everything, I would have been probably about 13, 14 at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what I ended up happening... I saw so much hatred from my dad that I turned that and, and put that towards Jehovah's Witnesses, mm-hmm. uh, the religion. Uh, it could have been any religion, but if you know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, they're the most restrictive religion, Christian religion that I'm aware of, even more restrictive than the Mormons. Um, so I pulled away from them, had nothing to do. I would sit on the sessions that mom did. She did a great job of trying to treat, teach us what the Bible teaches. She was a former Mormon and uh, that her great uncle was Harold B. Lee, one of the presidents of the Mormon church. So she has a very big history. And so there's a whole story behind how she became a Mormon. So then I went on to college to get away from, uh, or to start college, um, was agnostic, um, started, um, uh, studying, I was speech and drama major, but a minor in biology. And so my mother made contact with this gentleman called, um, I've used a pseudo name for him in the book. Um, let's just call him Bruce. Uh, <laughs> and, and he, he card contacted me and I was not happy. I was in Lathrop dorm in the university of Fairbanks in Alaska, and I told him, no, there's so much pain uh, that, that I have around this religion and what religion has done to my mom, and I don't think I really believe in God. He, I, I may, I mean, agnostic to me, there may be a God, there may be not a God, I just don't care. And so, but I was also against the Vietnam War. Um, I was during that time where I was uh, called up for the draft, but I had a student deferment, and so I ended up... Um, telling him, no, I'm not interested, telling him to go away and don't come back. Well, he kept coming back. And one day he said to me, you've got a lot of pain around your life with this religious thing. Can we talk about it? So for four hours, I just went off on him and told him how damaged I had been by what the religion had done. And so to make a long story uh, short, he ended up starting a study with me and I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses uh, during the time I was in college, the first year. Um, back at that time, if you were uh, going to be baptized as Jehovah's Witness, you could not go to college. You were considered worldly, worldly. Mm-hmm. And so I had to give up my own education to become Je- Jehovah's Witness. Oh. is the greatest one of the greatest mistakes I've made in my whole life um so what that ended up happening my dad didn't found out that I had given up my education or my scholarships didn't speak to me for three years um so I ended up becoming one of Jehovah's Witnesses I entered into the full-time ministry um I want to pause for a second because one of the things I realized that drew me so much Jehovah's Witnesses is I didn't have a family I had no family I had a family, but was an abusive family. And I saw the abuse of my brothers and sisters. I saw the abuse of my mother. And so here comes this family along that they're very loving, very kind. And mm-hmm. so I had a family that I had never had. Uh-huh. And I think that was one of the strong attractions to that. You got, they found you at a vulnerable moment. The yes. same, thing, same thing happened to a cousin of mine. Her husband died. She was grieving. They happened to knock on the door, right? And um, and and she went. But I, did you tell Bruce about your same sex feelings? No. Oh, I was. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't tell anybody. 
I didn't even I, I didn't even tell myself. I, mm. I started a process of denial. Yeah. And tried to convince myself I wasn't who I was. However, when I would see the guys come to the shower rooms, it was pretty exciting for me. Uh. Okay. Uh, but no, I, I had to bury um, who I was uh, because of the generation, also because the fact is that. I still felt being gay was wrong and it was a sin and it was against God. Mm. And so I started the burying of that and I used religion to bury that. I became a full-time pioneer. Um, Bruce and I became pioneer partners. Pioneer, by the way, means a full-time minister of Jehovah, what they call a regular pioneer. Um, and so we then went pioneering in the different villages of Alaska with the Eskimos. I did some work with the Eskimos there, which is very fascinating. You can read that in my memoir. And so I looked at trying to um, be the best that I could be with my family, my new family. Now, I want to make a comment about Jehovah's Witnesses. They're some of the most kindest, most loving and sincere people. Um, I believe that. I believe they live by the fruitage of the spirit there in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, wellness. Where my issue has now come, I do not believe in what they do organizationally. I just simply feel what is done is inhuman. Um, and so my issue and where I'm working today is separating Jehovah's Witnesses from God. There's a separation for me now, and I'm working on that because many of the principles I believe, when I was disfellowshipped from the church, I had no other friends because with Jehovah's Witnesses, your friends can only be Jehovah's Witnesses. You're not allowed or expected to have any worldly associations uh, except in work and so forth. So when I got disfellowshipped, I had no one. I lost all my family, I lost my friends. Um, and I knew that would be the risk. I knew that that would be a risk when I came out. Um, but that's why it was very to be courageous. Dan, uh when you were rejected, Haley, are you familiar with Jehovah Witness, the, what they believe? I carry on. I have a lot of questions okay. coming, so please carry okay. on. Okay. <laughs> Jehovah Witness uh, um, believe uh, only in God, not the Trinity. Um, they, they, they don't celebrate any holidays, Valentine's Day, Christmas, Easter. I think it's all worldly. And, um, and they really are closed in they don't recognize the flag the american the national anthem they won't stand for that or voting uh but it but you found them to be a really emotionally supportive uh group for you what how did you feel when you uh and what did it do to you when you felt separated from them well i think uh, the separation of course didn't come until years later um do you mean when, uh, how did I feel at the time I became Jehovah's Witness or at the time I was the fellowship? Well, when you lost your fellowship, when you, when you, when you, so you, when you were anathema to your family and to them. Well, to be honest with you, I've been to fellowship twice. <laughs> so there's a whole story because I was married the first um, 26 years of my life. I became a pioneer, um, fell in love with a girl who was also Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who had a lot of issues, alcoholism, drug abuse, bipolar, borderline, compulsive spender, compulsive rager. Uh, Brian, I picked a real good one, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what, Dan? Uh, you were the rescuer in your family, so you, totally. looked for some, you looked for somebody to rescue. And I actually married somebody who ended up becoming a rageful like my dad. But because of the religion and because the only reason you can divorce. Now, by that time, there was a whole history. I became an elder in the church. I was giving uh, public talks. I was doing some international work in, in, at the international conventions. I was a public speaker. Um, I had become a very, a, a very good uh, and dedicated Jehovah's Witnesses. And I truly believed at the time and still believe what, what, what it was and what was the good parts of that. I believe a lot of the things they teach. I believe their teachings of the Bible. Of course, they're against war. They won't go to war. I'm a total believer in that. So I want to really admonish the things I enjoyed. Where I struggled with is after my forced divorce, 
which I couldn't take it. I had her through two treatment centers. I just couldn't do it anymore. I was not allowed to ever remarry again. Oh. So for 18 years, I had to stay single um, because she had committed adultery, but she denied it. And because of that, um, I'm not allowed to remarry again. Certainly not a man, okay, mm -hmm. but not even a woman. Wasn't even allowed to date, uh, even have anything to do with a woman. Um, they also believe that all people who date only for getting married, they have to be chaperoned. Um, so what ended up happening, I tried to get my freedom. Things were supposed to be followed through that didn't get followed through. Um, I spent, when I went through a divorce with my first wife, uh, I didn't want to marry again. It was so horrendous and there was so much damage that had been done by her. And of course, I share some of that responsibility too. It did produce my daughter, Tiffany. Then I said, you know, I, I'm not going to remarry again. So it's okay. Well, after five years, I met another sister. Her name is Sandy. She will be in the book. Um, but we could only be friends, but we were not allowed to be in the congregation and, you know, look at each other in any type of way. And I fought that for nine years. Finally, mm -hmm. just um, what ended up my first divorce, I stayed single for 18 years by myself, very active in the church, elder in the congregation. Of course, I had that been taken away through my divorce. But then I worked myself back up again. So for 18 years, I was single and not allowed to date. But I began to realize that, you know, here I'm, a, I'm still a young man at the time. Um, Sandy and I started being connected. She was out of um, Washington, Bellevue, Washington, a regular pioneer there. Uh, she had been divorced from her husband, but he had admitted to adultery. So she was free to remarry. I was not. But she hadn't married for 20 years. Well, we ended up falling in love. And after nine years of going through um, horrible uh, scrutinizing by the congregation, and I was taken, given counsel about, like, you know, I see you looking at her and all this type of thing. And I think one thing that really kind of broke me to the organization when her father died, and I was very close to both her parents, then I wasn't allowed, I wouldn't give her a hug and held her hand while they died and I was scrutinized for that mm. and I this is a this is a human thing to do and so I got disfellowshipped and she got disfellowshipped when we got married and then we she decided she wanted to come back uh, I wanted to come back too so we after a year and a half again the shunning nobody could talk to us nobody had anything to do with us so after a year and a half we came back and um Again, there's a whole story how that all happened in the book. So then that's when I married the second time, um, got active back in the, the congregation again. Um, uh, Sandy and I, of course, moved to Seattle. I've, I've done very well financially, so I've been able to support her. And so that's when I got back and married. Now, what in, what's interesting, what happened? Um, we'd been married seven years and I had sold my business. Um, I'm an executive recruiter of my business in, let's see, I opened, um, let's see, management recruiters in 19, let's see, I started with selling and selling in 1967. I've been in the executive search business just under 50 years. Mm -hmm. And I used work addiction, religious addiction and work addiction to bury who I was. And in addition to that, because I was so successful, number one in the world with managed recruiters, run a number of national awards for them, they wanted me to do seminars for them when I opened up Dan Bone Associates. They were very upset that I was leaving the organization. And so I did a lot of other seminars. So my work increased from 60 hours a week to 90. Mm. I'm traveling all over the world doing, uh, well, mostly the United States, but a couple in the world too, other areas of the world. I got to be known then as a trainer of other recruiters with my success in the business. And so I was burying it more and more and more and more to where I could not have to deal with it. And I would have these feelings of being a gay man. Of course, now I'm married to a woman. Um, 
I just buried it deeper by working harder and taking more assignments on with the church, being a regular auxiliary pioneer at the time, and everything I could do to bury it because I wouldn't have any minute to think about who I really was because who I really was, I did not like. Mm -hmm. I did not like myself. Certainly didn't love myself. I didn't even like myself. And when I sold my business, um, uh, well, it was been about four years ago, I didn't have any work addiction anymore. And all of a sudden, I had to deal with who he was. I was still very active in the church. And all of a sudden, I had to deal with, at that time, was my demons. Um, and I, I, Sandy and I had started to separate on several different issues. She was um, very involved in the church. I was involved in now... I exercise, I exercise five, six days a week, I have for 40 some years. It's probably an addiction, <laughs> probably, but it's a good one, I guess. <laughs> so anyway, that's when I had to deal with who I was and how it's these feelings that I have. And, you know, and I have to give you a compliment, Brian, because one of the things that you have done for people of our generation is you've been open, you've been transparent, and you fought for the rights of gay people, not just gay, but uh, lesbians, transgender, queer, whatever. And I, I cannot thank you enough for the work that mm. you have. It's been phenomenal what you've done. You've been a trooper, you've been a pioneer, and you've done it because of your heart and because of who you know who you are. And I think that has given me a lot of encouragement. Um, so into what ended up happening, um, I ended up meeting a guy at a bar, or not a bar, excuse me, at a club, um, a health club, um, became friends, ended up having a one-time affair with him, and went home and told my wife immediately. Exactly. Wow. Were you wow. to Jehovah's at this point? Or yes. You, okay. Yes. Um, so I went and told her exactly what happened that night. She was devastated. Uh, we had both agreed if either of us would commit adultery that the marriage was over. So I knew it was over. So because of that, the elders were brought in. They were there till one o'clock in the morning. They had to set up a judicial committee, which I've served on many of them. Um, and to make a long story short, um, or maybe a long story longer, is the fact that there was a judicial committee I went into severe depression. Uh, I had a home here and I had a home in Payson, Arizona golf course. And I also had a condo on the ocean in California. So I decided I'm gonna go get away from here. And so I chose the one in Payson to go to. And they had a judicial committee, but I went into severe depression, became suicidal. Mm. Um, and I said, please don't meet with me right now. Wait until I get, at least get through this process because I felt like I had failed. Um, oh, certainly the wife I love. I had failed the organization. I had failed all my friends. I certainly had failed my family. And so I'm stuck with nobody um, other than Jason, who I sold the company with, who's been like a son to me. And so I think it was just during that moment of darkness that I began to realize this is the only way to get out of this maybe is to get a sense of peace. We just check out of it. But I also knew I had a daughter and I had three grandchildren. And so, you know, when you're in depression and, and, and Brian, I know you went through that with the paint thinner. Mm -hmm. You know that your thinking isn't straight. I think a Voltaire was a, poet that said should you want to take your life today if you waited till tomorrow you would have had a different feeling about it and so what ended up happening they set up a judicial committee in my home and I had to travel back to Scottsdale and I said I did not want to do it they said well your wife is in pain you're going to have to take care of this so I was sobbing in when they had the judicial committee and so I I just they came to me and I had to admit the first time I was a gay man. Now I had told my wife before, which was, we had received counseling at an organization called PCP. We'd gotten counseling. I did not go in there telling them I was gay. Um, I went there because we were having other issues. Um, so 
to make a long story short is that I started telling them that I know what I did is wrong. I am so sorry. I never had committed uh, adultery in my whole life. My first wife was married 26 years. It never happened. No adultery. I didn't do any type of sex for 18 years. I was completely, you know, normal. Um, you're not even allowed to masturbate. That's considered a bad habit. I did it. I, I did it for three, three times in 18 years. Okay. Um, so I think it was kind of like sexually anorexic is what I was. Mm -hmm. So I think I end up realizing that I've lost everything. And so what made the difference is that I said to them, I'm a gay man. I've acted out, which is considered probably the worst thing you can do is to act out with a man even worse than acting out with a woman. Um, but I said, I, 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 I'm not going to live inauthentically anymore. This is who I am. Uh, I'm sobbing all of this. Some of it I don't remember. And I said, I can't hear it. I, I, I know what I've done to my wife is wrong. And I will always deal with the guilt I have of that. So I said to them, but I cannot make a commitment that I will live as a gay man or not gay man. And because I couldn't say, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again, blah, 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 blah. They sent me outside and I was just fellowship. I was kicked out. Mm -hmm. um, it was devastating for me because now I had lost my new family, my, my wife and my new family, which were Jehovah's Witnesses. At that time, it was a new family. But, and so I thought I'd lost everything. So I went out in the patio um, Sandy, of course, was hysterical, went back in the bedroom and I started drinking and I just kept drinking. And to make a long story longer, I went in to get some limoncello and I slipped and hit my head and um, busted my scalp and was laying on the floor bleeding out. I take Coumadin because of my heart issues. And she heard the crash, came out, and then um, called the, you know, obviously the paramedics. And uh, they came to get me. And I said, I said, I'm a gay man. I've lost everything. Please, let's let me bleed out. I don't want to live. Mm -hmm. And so they rushed me to the hospital. Sandy didn't know whether I was going to live or die. Um, and... Um, Obviously, they put 40 staples in my head. Um, and that was where I realized how deep and how far I had gone down and how depressed I had become. And so to make a long story, longer, I keep using that phrase, but <laughs> it's, like, I gotta, it's my connector phrase. Uh, I tried to get back again. I tried for a whole year. And that was interesting. They didn't even come and see me. The elders didn't even come see me. They can't talk and have anything to do with me which I think is inhuman. I think mm -hmm. it's totally inhuman. Um, and so I tried, we have a very big home here in Scottsdale, 6,200 square feet. So I stayed in one end of the house, she stayed in the other. And I tried for a whole year to come back, to get back what I had lost. So I kind of come out of the closet. Now I'm forcing myself to go back in the closet. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's like, I tried for a year. And of course I had to do the walk of shame I'd go to the meetings, we'd take separate cars. There was no physical affection. Um, she's not allowed to have anything physically to do. If we have physical affection and, and it's consummated, then, that's her, then she's forgiven me. So if you connect with sex, then that's a forgiveness issue, then she can't divorce me for scriptural mm -hmm. reason. So we lived separately for over a year and I tried to do the walk of shame every week and I would go back and I would come home and I would cry on the way home. And after a year and a half, I said, this is, this is not who I am. And this is not the life I wanna live. And so I finally, uh, because of me meeting this guy at the gym, a younger man, younger than me, and so I started changing gyms. I connected with John, who is my partner now. 
who's a director of physical fitness right now for the gym. And we became friends. And uh, he didn't know I was gay. Uh, he had been married to a man, which he shared with me, been with him 18 years. And we became very, very close friends, uh, just total friends. Um, and that went on for a period of time. And I finally realized I'm a gay man. In order for me to be authentic, I have to leave the church mm -hmm. and I have to leave my wife. She was hoping that I would come back to the church, which was a requirement, she said, or the divorce would be over. There would be a divorce. So I finally went home to her that night. I'm one that does not cover up anything. When I make a mistake, I try to own it immediately. And I went home to her that night. And after I talked to John and realized I had feelings for John, but I, he was married to a man, been together 18 years, and I'm not going to ruin another marriage. But I went home to her and knew what it was like to feel a love for a man, to actually feel love for a man, mm -hmm. not just the sexual contact, the whole aspect of what love is, emotional, um, spiritual on my part. John is not so much spiritual because he's atheist and I'm okay with that. Um, so I just told her that night, I said, Sandy, you're married to a gay man. This is not fair to you and not fair to me. I need to file for divorce tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And how so- old, with, How old were you at that moment? How I've been, old were you? I've been about probably four and a half. Well, I would have probably been still 70, 71. Okay. I'd say 70, a 70, because I tried for a whole year. And that's when I realized I filed for divorce. Um, we still stayed in the same house. But what I can say came over me at that time was a sense of peace I've never had in my whole life. I was accepting and starting to love Dan Bolin as a gay man. Mm -hmm. And that love is, and that peace I have, is something I will never give up. Mm -hmm. Because I believe in my understanding and my, my feeling about my own self, is if you can't love yourself or who you are, you cannot love somebody else. Mm -hmm. You have to have that self-love first. And the peacefulness came from that too, because I was peaceful and I had self-love. And then it, it was, it was, it was, really devastating to her and, and devastating to me. She's still grieving over it, although it's gotten better now. And we do have some contact with each other, um, uh, minimal, okay. So we, I, I, I started the process then of a divorce. And then we had had, um, I had a prenuptial agreement set up. And uh, so within six months, I was able to get a divorce. And at that time we were living uh, obviously the same home, but once the divorce was final, then she moved out and, and I gave her the home. I had a home in California on the ocean, which I gave her as a gift um, in addition to the prenuptial agreement as well. So since that time, I, I think I started growing as a, as a real man, as a real gay man and understanding this denial. You know, Brian and Haley, when, when you or in so much denial of who you are, you start believe, believing your own crap after a while. Mm -hmm. You start believing that you really are, are, are not a good, you start believing your own stuff because until you accept who you are and you embrace that gift and that gift that you give yourself is the gift you can extend to others. And I think that's where I've always been able to um, I've always been able to have an interest in people. I love people. I was in the people business. I was an executive recruiter. I love people. I, that's my whole life is loving people and pleasing people. And I was doing that when I wasn't pleasing myself. The reason I wasn't pleasing myself, I wasn't accepting myself as who I was. Dan, I wanted to go back to the idea of identity. And <clears throat> here where I am in San Cristobal, it's a very... Um, spiritual place. There's every religion, every spiritual aspect you can imagine in this tiny little center. 
And sort of what my first observation after being here for three weeks is that a lot of people come here looking for an identity and looking for somebody to tell them who they are. And your story of sort of going into Jehovah's Witness feels that it was sort of similar, looking for a family or community to say, hey, this is who you are. And now you're part of a family. These are the cultural norms of the family. Does that resonate with you at all? I th I, it totally does. And I think also I'm a rule follower. My dad insisted on rules. Yeah. And I joined an organization that had lots and lots of rules. That's a wonderful segue because I'm um, not gay. Um, I have a very similar story to yours um, in terms of a childhood perspective. And th there's a lot of comfort in rules. And mm -hmm. I would imagine, you know, at least from my experience working with people, loving people, loving humanity, when we're looking for that identity, we're looking for that comfort of rules because that's what we consider love. No matter Absolutely. how harsh it is, no matter how traumatic it is, that's our definition, our perception of love. Mm. I totally agree with that. I'm sorry, go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say, um, you know, I've been coloring outside of the line since I was little. So I, 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 when I left the monastery after three months, they said, Brian, there's a constant but subtle submission of will here. And I guess that was not me. <laughs> and they said, no pets, I got a hamster. I mean, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Haley, I'm fascinated with that. Dan, you, your story breaks my heart. I got to tell you, uh, it breaks my heart. But I'm, but I'm also excited for you that, you know, at age 70... Uh, you have a chance now to live the rest of your life authentically, joyfully, and and wholly, that you've come together whole and holy, H-O-L-Y, uh, that the universe is, is, has filled you with love. And, and that I'm, I'm very happy about that. Haley, you had you have a hundred questions. <laughs> so that was sort of my first observation and sort of that similarity, you know, I grew up in a very straight household. Religion wasn't a big thing, but there are these similarities. And I think that's the reason why Brian and I decided to create this chat was to be able to show that similarity on the hero's journey where coming out of the closet is really understanding your identity based on who you really are in your heart and coming to that. And my next question for you was about love. And that was one of the things that really um, stuck with me when I read sort of some, some of your bio. You did love. You have had a life of loving and being sort of falling in love with women, albeit different. Is that right? Or now that you've experienced perhaps what is truer love, do you can still consider that love with your previous wives? Yes, I consider it love. But I consider the love more deeper because my love is more authentic. Right. If love was more authentic. Yeah, it's exactly. You're taking and, questions out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and, I, and I think I, my first wife, um, I, I fell in love. I married very young. I was married 21 years old. And of course, Jehovah's Witness, you can't have intimacy unless you're married. So, you know, at that time, I'm a 21-year-old um, hormone-based man, and I married primarily for sex. But I loved her in the sense that I could love as a 21-year-old. Um, so, yes, I loved her at the time. My second wife, Sandy, totally loved her, um, and I still love her. Amazing. Uh, I used to use an expression to her, Sandy, I will love you and love you forever and then some. And that's the phrase I always say, Sandy, I love you and I love you forever and then some. That's been hard for her to hear now because I still love her deeply. I still love her deeply. I love her more than I've ever loved any other woman. Now, when it comes to John, I have a deep love for him. Uh, we've been together now a little over two years. And we have deep love. Is it the deepest love I've ever had? To be honest with you, it is. Because it's just not the physical love. It's the connection. It's the 
authenticity of it. It's, um, I mean, John and I uh, have a beautiful life together. We rarely disagree on anything, but when we do, our love is so deep, we will work it out. Mm -hmm. And that workout comes through communication and openness and honesty. Um, so yes, I loved all three of them, but my deeper love in a more of a complete sense is with John. Now, if our relationship doesn't work out, I would, would I be devastated? Yes, but I would survive. And the reason I would survive, Haley, is because of my love for me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I believe one, that. Yeah, I have one more question for you. And when you were going through sort of that multiple dark nights of the soul, sort of when you had your fear and everything is crumbling down, your tower moment, where was God for you at that point? Or... Were you speaking to God at that point? Great question. I'm going to have to go back and just clarify a little bit. And I still, I'm struggling with this, but I'm doing better with it. I have to separate God, which I believe in Jehovah's Witnesses teach his name is Jehovah, Yahweh, but we use Jehovah, from Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. The two are intermine, they're connected. You cannot love Jehovah unless you love his organization. So I've got that bright brain set or that, that cult feeling in my head that I have to work against. So when I rejected Jehovah's Witnesses, I felt like I had been rejected by God. Mm -hmm. And so because of the connection, because there's the organization. In fact, Jehovah's Witnesses use the expression, the faithful and discreet slave, which is the governing body. They call them the mother of the, of the mother of the organization. Well, I don't believe that. Um, they also believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones that will really gain eternal life. I don't believe that at all. There's many beautiful, wonderful people like you and Ryan and, and John and so many wonderful people in my life that I believe I believe in God. I believe in an afterlife. Um, so I had a I had a disconnection from God, and I haven't prayed to Him a lot. But He knows that, and He understands that, and He understands the separation I'm going through. And so I do say prayer to Him, but not like I used to. But I will get that back in my life. I have to kind of grieve the loss of the organization yeah. to accept that there's a difference between God and what the organization teaches. And it's becoming more clear and clear and clear to me every day. So my prayers of Jehovah or God are not what I want them to be yet. He understands, he knows it. Um, I used to pray to him all the time to take the gay away, continually take it, take it, take it. You know, what's interesting. You pray and pray and pray and you wake up and you're still gay. Yeah. You're still and so, I had a lot of shame around that with God, you know, and of course they use the scriptures about what Paul said about homosexuality. It's interesting. Jesus never said one word about it. Mm -mm. He never said one word about homosexuality and they had it in his day. So I'm creating, I'm, I know that I know that God loves me. I know that Jesus is the savior. I will get to where I need to be there. I'm not there yet. Um, and during that time where I was being uh, disfellowshipped and went through all that dark place, I felt in my head that God was with the organization. So it's like that kind of, he was like, the organization got rid of you. Now God's getting rid of you. Yeah, I can I identify. Feel, I don't feel that way now. I can identify with that. You know, leaving the Catholic church was really hard for me because, yeah. uh, you know, you're a cradle to grave Catholic. Uh, you know, 16 years of Catholic education. So when I left the church, because I didn't agree with its theology, and I left it at a time where Jerry Falwell with his moral majority, you know, was was uh, creating such hostility. I, I left Jesus, you know, Jesus was my buddy. And uh, I thought, you know what, if these are your friends, take them, I don't care. <laughs> I'm, I'm going right. to go off on my own. But Dan, I found it helpful to change the name, you know, uh, I didn't use God for a long time. And still, you know, I talk about um, love with a capital L or, uh, or, or the light, 
or the universe or, you know, and I found that if I changed the name, it was easier for me to have a relationship with it than uh, it was with this God that was clearly defined by a church that I don't agree with. Um, so you may find that usually I was going to ask you two, two questions. One, how did you find my book? Because it's only available on Amazon. And two, are you part of any faith community now? Uh, I found your book because I, I've been, been reading about gay stories, particularly those that are in my generation period. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so I had gotten on Amazon um, and looking for different books and I saw yours there. Okay. And I was intrigued with it. Um, and then I ordered the, the, I ordered the two books um, on being gay and being gay and gray, being gay and gray. They didn't, couldn't get it to me right away. I don't know what, what it was, but it took a while for me to get to it. And I finished reading that book and I said, I've got to get a hold of Brian mm. and let him know how much impact that he's made not only in my life, but on other lives as well. Um, so that's how I contacted you. And that's how I was able to, to um, I, I find stuff like that so encouraging and face drinking for me, you know, because when you're going through so much denial your whole, life, denial your whole life, you really think you're the only one, mm -hmm. but you're not the only one. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a unique story. Everybody has a different story. Um, and that's how I, I read your book. And I, I, I thought it was fantastic. Both of them are great. Now, as far as a faith that I've embraced yet, I have not. Um, I know the Bible quite well. I read it through 18 times in 18 years. Mm -hmm. I read it through once a year for 18 years straight. So I know it very well. I have some issues with the issues of war in the Bible in the Old Testament about God destroying, you know, women and children. I doesn't, I've always had issues with that. Mm -hmm. So, but I also believe, um, I don't believe in the Trinity. Uh, there's certain things through my own education I believe in. So I have to get my relationship with God to where it's, 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 it's more together more. I struggled with using the word Jehovah because when I use Jehovah, I associate with Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. yeah. I kind of yeah. got to where I call him God now. Yeah. Because when I say Jehovah, it puts me back in that amishment again. I would I would cancel that word for a while. Yeah. But I thought you know, I find I'm sorry, Haley. I, I just was gonna say I find a, uh, that the Center for Spiritual Living, which used to be um, science of mind, I think uh, you would find yourself very comfortable there. Uh, Center for Spiritual Living. I'm sure there's one in Scottsdale. Um, Haley, I told Dan when, when he said he was in Scottsdale that when I was a kid, my folks used to take <laughs> us there to the Yellow Boot Ranch uh, uh, just at the base of Camelback Mountain. There's a big mountain in uh, Arizona. Am I right, Dan? You're right. In fact, I have an open view of Camelback Mountain on wow, my back. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Haley, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just, you know, for <clears throat> me and my journey, and a lot of my journey has and is still um, getting over my anger with God. Every time I think it's just an emotional thing with humans, it really goes down to God. Mm. And, you know, perhaps your faith is in you now. And I think there's no closer relationship than having faith in yourself because ultimately you are acknowledging God in you. Yes. I, I, I think I agree, I, I, I agree with that. Why um, can't your faith be you? I think that's part of it. Um, but I think there, I, I think for me, I have to have that belief in a higher power. Um, I don't believe my faith is my higher power. I believe that I have faith in myself and my faith can be in myself. But I think it ha my faith has to be with the higher power. And that higher power, I prefer to call God. Um, so I think both are true. Mm -hmm. and, and Dan, Haley and I would say the higher power is in you. It's in you. It's in me. It's in Haley. And that our, what our lives are about is allowing it to shine you know, allowing it to glow, manifest itself fully in us, which, which happened with Jesus. 
you know, Jesus was man who completely got it. You know, he was fully aware. And so, you know, which is what I aspire to, Haley aspires to. Uh, and so when, when Haley talks about, you know, your faith in you, she, I, I believe, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, Haley, but she's basically saying that, you know, embracing your own divinity. Is that right, my friend? It, yeah, I think it, I mean, it's not easy. It's incredibly complex. And I think the first step is being able to acknowledge yourself and start with the self-love and start with the rituals where you give thanks for your beautiful body and everything that you've been through and that, my God, you must be special if you've got to this point now. Mm. You know, you really, you, I mean, you've made it an incredible journey, Dan. I, I know that it's, you know, you look in the rearview mirror and you think about the past, but you've already gotten out of the accident, you know, and the road ahead is clear. You know? There's no more bumps, there's no more potholes, there's no more obstruction. And so instead of looking back, um, and you can in terms of loving the people from your past, but now's your chance, you know, sing your song, you know, <laughs> let it be heard. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of both of you to say. I think one thing too, that has got me to go forward with my book. It was supposed to be, as I said, originally just for my family and friends. Now I've decided to go public with it. And now one of my, uh, actually my writer, co-writer with me, Landon said, Dan, you need to do a podcast. You've got an incredible story. And so, because I wanna give people a look at what can happen in their life if they em embrace who they truly are, mm -hmm. which I did at later in life, then I wanna be able to help those. Another reason too is unfortunately in the gay community, there are a lot of gay men that are living a secret life. They're not identifying they're gay, but they're going out and having affairs with men, or they could be a woman having affairs with another woman and they're, they're cheating on their wives. Now that's different than an open relationship where both of them agree that we're married, you can go out and have a relationship. That's, that's different than what I'm talking about. But I've seen so many of these, uh, and John's helped me to appreciate it because John came out at 26. He's now 54. Um, and he says how many gay men out there who are married to women and are cheating on their women and their women do not know about that. Now, I'm not trying to be a moral judgment here. That's not what I'm saying. But if I can help one person who is doing that, because I'm a tone believer in open honesty and being transparent, mm -hmm. total believer in that. Because I think if you're not open and honest, that transparent and transparent, it'll come back to bite you in the butt if you're not mm -hmm. eventually. And so one of the things I'm hoping that if one person reads my book, one person um, I can interview on a podcast or whatever can really understand that, yeah, you're gonna, you think you're gonna lose your family. You think your wife's gonna divorce you. You, th you, you think all these different things. Some of them may be true. Most of them are not true. And I think to help those individuals to really embrace who they are, and be open and honest with their wives because their wives are suffering too. Mm -hmm. They're suffering not only because their mate is cheating on them, but they could be open to, you know, a, a, a disease. I mean, there's so many things that can happen. And so I hope that I can help individuals who may be struggling with who they are because these are gay men that are married to women and have children and grandchildren like I do. And maybe it'll make some difference in their life. So, and that's my way to be able to get back to the community and be able to carry on what, what Brian has done, to be a part of a movement um, that, that we're gonna be open and honest. We're so far ahead in the gay movement than we were when I was being raised, so far ahead. But we're not where we need to be yet. We still are not equal. No. We have a long way to go for yeah. all of us. And I think right. you know, there's no better time than now. And we are out of time, gentlemen. Okay. Thank you so much. Has it really gone? Wonderful sharing. And I
Yeah, My I life told is them. blessed even more today, knowing you and knowing your story. Thank you. Well, Me thank too. you very much. Yeah, it's such sorry. a privilege to be able to talk with you. And I, I thank you both for the work that you're doing as well. Thank you. Our guest, Dan Boland, has a book coming out in the fall. It's called The Courage to be Courageous. And, and you know, you took a great step today by leaping into this. I invited him yesterday to be on this program. <laughs> and Haley, you are so cool. I'll, you know, I keep showing up with people and you never say, wait, wait, wait. You know, I think, you know, it's and it's also a source of pride for me because my part of my path too is just being open to yeah. every version of humanity. And it's one of the wonderful things about being here. The yeah. diversity is amazing. And, you know, you never learn more than when you're in the fire, like hot feet, get cracking with it. <laughs> I want to share one thing about the book. It's called The Courage to Be Courageous, as Brian said, but it also is a memoir of struggle, success, and truth. Jehovah's Witnesses call their belief the truth. Well, my truth is different now. Yep. And you're going to find out what my truth, truth is. Moi. And I you are you very much entitled to your truth. Thank you so much. Thank Love, you, Dave. We'll speak soon.